commence our webinar shortly. My name is Fola Adeleke. I am going to be your host for today's webinar. Welcome to the Mandela Institute on behalf of its director, Professor Firoz Kachalia. Uh, my role is to introduce this webinar within the broader research projects of the Mandela Institute on data protection in Africa. And then I'm going to introduce our speakers who would have about 12 minutes each to speak. And to introduce this project, um, I'd like to narrate to you how we effectively ended up arriving at conceptualizing this project that we're doing at the Mandela Institute. When I started my career working for a nonprofit in South Africa several years ago, I had the opportunity to travel to the Democratic Republic of Congo on a project aimed at helping civil societies to push for the adoption of a rights information law. One evening after we completed the workshop, our host took us to the shores of the Congo River to take in the sights and sounds of Kinshasa City. And standing on the shores of the river, you can see across the river another city named Brazzaville, which is the capital of another country called the Congo. The river is only about eight kilometers wide and locals travel on it on a similar boat that you are looking at in this image that you can see on your screen. A woman waiting to board one of those boats attempted to sell something to me and while she waited, I engaged in small talk with her. Curious to know whether our claim as researchers was shared by citizens that information rights unlock access to other tangible socioeconomic rights. I asked her what she thought about the value of open government as a priority for the government of the DRC, given the dire state of the economic affairs in the country. In responding to me, she narrated her personal experience about what happens when she bought the boat from Kinshasa to Brazzaville. She said occasionally, a uniformed officer on the boat would confront her about selling on, on the boat and, and demand some form of payment. Citing a vague law, they would tell her that what she was doing was not permissible. This woman said she believed no such law existed, but felt powerless to do anything to challenge it. She felt transparency about trade rules on these international routes was necessary to prevent exploitation. During this workshop, I was also working on a research project looking at regional integration, competition law, and international trade in Africa. And it was for the first time after having this conversation with this woman that I made a connection between what I thought were previously distinct areas of law, access to information law on the one hand, and um, regional integration and free trade on the other. Today, the interconnectedness of these areas of law in Africa has shifted from Africans like this woman crossing physical country borders to sell goods to the online marketplace where digital trade, which is borderless, is at the center of building Africa's digital economy with significant implications for regulators on how to regulate digital trade, how to regulate the private actors in this space, and how to protect Africans not only as consumers, but also as economic participants in this brave new world of the internet economy that is largely driven by data. Three fundamental rights are squarely implicated in the context of data protection, namely the right to privacy, access to information, and freedom of expression. However, in regulating, from the research that we've been doing so far, we can see that states need to regulate in a manner that ensures domestic inequality and poverty are reduced. Any policy measures that promote sustainable development and inclusive growth, while simultaneously guaranteeing an adequate level of data protection is necessary. However, across African states, as we hear today, we see policy interventions that point to a state-centric approach to the data economy, socioeconomic justifications for data localization, including promoting inclu innovation and inclusive growth at the domestic level should the de development of the digital economy is happening. We need to acknowledge that the uneven distribution of power and wealth is apparent when one considers that the value presented by digital superstar farms often drives the GDP of most countries. Can we please uh, mute ourselves, please, so that only the presenter is speaking at any point in time? We should also recognize that data's value is maximized when it can flow with trust and permission across companies, sectors, and national borders. So this project is part of a series of 
research publications under the Mandela Institute titled Africa's Digital Economy, Protectionism, Development and Democracy. And this project is being funded by Facebook. And the research question that we effectively are grappling with in this research project is to, is to answer how can countries use digital regulation to promote inclusive development and to, and, and to modernize intra-African trade? And why should transnational regulation in certain sectors play a role in shaping these developments? And our ultimate objectives are to develop an African governance model that responds to unique African challenges, to identify key technology priorities, to promote Pan-African cooperation for digital regulation and to leverage data for inclusive development. And today, our first speaker is, is Malcolm Kijira, who is an admitted attorney and advocate of the High Court of Kenya and Australia and holds multiple degrees in information technology from Kenya and Australia. He has written a policy paper that I'm going to share with you in the chat box um, with Ilin Wangari Tso, who is a research fellow at the Kenyan School of Internet Governance. In their paper, they argue that privacy and data protection laws in Kenya are greatly influenced by international laws and best practices. And the challenges that make the implementation of these laws um, and policies difficult include significant cultural differences, different privacy expectations, regulatory frameworks, technology capacity, as well as the high dependency on non-African manufacturers and service providers across the continent. I will now hand over to Malcolm Kijira to take us through his presentation. Um, thank you very much, Fola, for that um, introduction. Um, and thank you for um, both the esteemed participants and also the um, participants that have joined us here today. I will quickly just, um, if I may, I think I do have rights for presentation, Fola. So I'll quickly just. OK. Um, bear with me one moment. Let's get to the front and just let me know, Fola, if you're able to view my screen there. Yes, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Fola has introduced me, so I won't get um, into it more than just saying, as I said, I am um, uh, an, an advocate for the High Court in Kenya, and I, I um, work in a full service law firm called Victor Lee Legal here in Nairobi, Kenya. Um, I will share my details also on the chat after that. We've got a very short period of time, so it'll be difficult to engage on many things, but I'll put my email, phone number, etc. should any of you want to engage further beyond this, this particular forum. So I, I, I was tasked with, um, as part of this broader project, looking at data localization in Kenya, the potential economic impact and effects on Kenya's commitments in various regional treaty frameworks. Um, and as I said, I worked on this with a, with a research assistant named Aileen Wangari. So I'll quickly get into this. Um, I am a lawyer and also worked in academia, so I have a pension for verbiage. I will try to, to get through it as quickly as possible so the other esteemed guests can um, also provide their, their, their presentations. As I said, if there are questions, etc. after that, I'll be happy to engage post this. Just a quick um, most of you will already be familiar with this, but just in the event that there's any participants that are not uh, familiar with data localization, I thought I'd touch on a bit of a generic, general, and more technical definition. They tend to vary. Um, data localization is a form of restriction of data flows across national borders. Um, more technically, it can be referred to as mandatory legal or administrative requirements, directly or indirectly stipulating the data be stored or processed exclusively or non-exclusively within a specified jurisdiction. Um, the, 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 the process I'll take with this presentation is to firstly just go, as I said, broadly give you that background of data localization. I'll then advise you of the framework that sits in Kenya and then go to the regional frameworks that influence um, the data localization laws and frameworks in Kenya and perhaps give my views um, and recommendations on my thoughts in this space at the end of it. Um, the growth in the processing of personal data, as you all know, I don't think this is anything new, it has been seen to go hand in hand with globalization of society and it's driven by the internet. We all know the premise of data is a new oil. There's the growth of data analytics, um, artificial intelligence, big data, um, cloud computing, um, that has been a further driver of increased data flows and information sharing. COVID-19 pandemic, we're living in this new normal. We are currently virtually speaking um, so that has definitely seen increased reliance on online at the expense of offline. I handle a lot of meetings now in my law firm 
virtually. There's a lot of virtual exchange of data in, the, in, this, in my specific space, and I'm sure that is the same in many areas of um, where you work. So data localization requirements have emerged as a major issue, particularly in trans-border data flows. Um, beyond that, when you look at it from a national level, there has been an increasing international tension and an inward focus amongst countries. Um, a lot of pundits in this space point to the Edward Snowden revelations where there was the sharing of NSA, National Security Agency information, as a turning point in this space. It's one of them, not all, but that has been, um, that's an, a really good example of why, um, as the next statement says, common legal restrictions on data processing often do not apply or are significantly different in the context of national security, intelligence services, and law enforcement. And of course, that's from the, the, the public um, governance side, from the more private sector actors, there has been the, hang, the hunger for ever increasing data collection and the economic value of personal data that has led to some serious abuses in the space of digital rights by some private actors. Various justifications given for, for this, and I will caveat that this, this, um, this presentation um, is based on my views. They, they differ depending on where you sit. If you're a private actor or perhaps you're a policymaker in government, you may have different views on this. So I'll caveat that a lot of what I am presenting here is based on my specific views. Um, so various countries have justified the need to control data flows through a, for a multitude of reasons. Given some there, national security, as I mentioned, cybersecurity, data protection and economic protectionism. Um, Fola mentioned that um, and, and, and there are others I've li listed there, data sovereignty, data access by governments, IP protection, and I mean, cybersecurity, which is to help and curb computer related crime and also to regulate corporate behavior. I'll now go quickly into giving you a, an overview of Kenya's data localization frameworks, um, primarily the laws on privacy and data protection um, get their bearing from our constitution, specifically Article 31C and D, which guarantee the right for every person not to have information relating to their family or private affairs and necessarily revealed, and the right not to have the privacy of their communications infringed. Beyond that, we have the Data Protection Act, very recent development um, enacted in November of 2019. And we also have proposed data protection general regulations and specifically regulation 25 therein. Um, I'll touch on those a bit more broadly. Um, now with the Data Protection Act, section 50 um, outlines that the cabinet secretary, equivalent of a minister, may prescribe based on grounds of strategic interests of the state or the protection of revenue, certain nature of processing that should only be affected through a server or data center located in Kenya. Um, the term data localization itself is not defined under the act. However, as you can see with section 50, it allows the cabinet secretary to stipulate um, the grounds which personal data should be stored and processed in Kenya. Um, in addition to that, certain restrictions have been introduced with respect to cross-border data transfers under section 48 of the Data Protection Act. Um, the act prohibits those transfers unless such transfers are to a country with adequate levels of protection. That's quote unquote adequacy status as is, is what it's called in different jurisdictions. So the, that means adequate levels of protection that are the same as Kenya or approvals have been obtained after the data controller or data processor has given sufficient proof that measures have been put in place to protect the personal data. Quickly mention that those haven't been tested. As I said, it's a relatively new regulatory framework. Um, so, um, you know, the, the data regulator hasn't had a chance to, you know, engage with what are adequate levels of protection. Um, when we are speaking about sufficient proof, is this left to the data exporters that, that all tend to vary um, to give that, that technical information? So it hasn't been through any process of, um, I guess, regulatory or even judicial review as yet. Um, then there's section 49 with respect to sensitive data, which states that it may only be transferred outside the country where the data subject has given express consent, consent um, and effective and appropriate safeguards have been put in place in line with the requirements or conditions set by the data commissioner. Again, not yet tested. Um, so there, there is a gap there, but obviously as, as we progress with time, I'm sure there will be complaints in this space and we'll be able to give you more specific uh, information on how it has been implemented. Um, I mentioned that there are uh, um, subsidiary uh, regulations specifically the proposed data protection general regulations. 
these have not yet been promulgated. So I'll caveat that. There was, they've just been undergoing public um, participation process and there's a task force that's been put together to, to consider them. And I think at the moment they're currently doing that, but it suffices to at least review them to get a, a feel of what they've drafted and where they might be going. Um, and, and effectively, um, Regulation 25 under those regulations states that a data controller or data processor, processor who processes personal data for the purpose of actualizing public good, that's important, um, shall be required to ensure that processing is affected through a server and data center located in Kenya. And at least one serving copy of the concerned personal data is stored in a data center located in Kenya. Um, I put out my tentacles um, you know, as a good lawyer to try and stay um, ahead of the curve here and see where they're going. The wind seems to be blowing from a discussion I had um, with, with a little birdie, uh, quote unquote, that um, they are currently leaning towards a non-exclusive data localization method, which I, I, I am for. Um, so in terms of looking at that provision there, the conjunctive word end will likely be or. Um, so it will be, shall be required to ensure that such processing is affected through a server and data center located in Kenya, or at least one serving copy of the concerned personal data is stored. But as I said, that, that is where I believe the wind is blowing and, and we will wait to see once they're promulgated what, what, what happens in that space. I won't go through what the public good is in a lot of detail. I've put some examples there, but what is contemplated includes things like the conduct of elections, managing electronics payments, facilitating education, um, et cetera. Interesting to note is the choice of words in the two instruments I've just gone through. Now, the section 50 of the act states that the measures put in place should be with respect to strategic interests of the state or for the protection of revenue. And that's a power given to the cabinet secretary. The subsidiary regulation says that these measures are quote unquote for the public good. Now, both of those statements are not defined in, in the specific instruments. So there is some inconsistency there that may open room or allow for um, additional data localization measures to be put in place on the grounds of the overtly broad strategic interest of the state. What is that? What can the cabinet secretary throw under that specific very broad um, term? Now, taking a step, just a little quick step, just before that, the, the, the promulgation or the enactment of the Data Protection Act, there was data protection and localization laws that were primarily housed in specific sector specific legislation. Um, they are broadly in line with the provisions prescribed in the regulation that I just went to. So you'll find some of these in the financial sector, health, telecommunications and security space. Of course, if the regulations pass, um, then my expectation is that the data localization requirements shall manifest primarily under the DPA. And maybe then there might be some work to look at whether there's any conflicts and sort of consolidate this to ensure that there, you know, there's no conflicts or, or duplication. Now, quickly, um, my view on what the key drivers of localization laws are in Kenya, um, primarily protection and collection of revenue. Kenya, as with all other countries, particularly in Africa, because we're talking about this region, has been facing huge economic challenges given the COVID-19 pandemic. And in this space and across all really technical spaces, there's been increased measures to raise revenue through taxation. So um, this has necessitate, necessitated, uh, pardon me, the government's taxation and policy makers to effect measures to track and access financial data. I mentioned national security when I was talking about N N Edward Snowden previously, goes without saying um, there are concerns, government concerns, policy makers concerns for protection of acts against, of terrorism, sabotage, technical faults, protection of critical infrastructure and other national security concerns. Those are shared across the board in Africa and international jurisdictions. Now, the, the crux of what we're speaking about is the effect of um, um, data, data localization, looking at it broader in the space of regional considerations and regional um, trade frameworks specifically. Um, so there are various regional laws that affect, that can affect and will affect our regulatory framework here in Kenya. Um, I'll discuss them. I'll try quickly to focus on those that Kenya is a signatory or has ratified. There are some frameworks that I'll touch on, like I've said there, the Malibu Convention. That's the AU Convention on Cybersecurity and Personal Data Protection. Kenya has not signed nor ratified it, although there is, um, I, I will touch on it later because there is some input to this discussion that we're currently having here. Um, I'll also give a bit more time on the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement 
um, as I'm sure some of the other participants will because of its prominence and its impact um, across Africa and as I caveat there, if successfully implemented. First one I'll touch on is the, uh, our, the EAC, or the East African Community. Um, Kenya is a member of the East African Community. Um, one of its key pillars is to enable trade in the community um, through allowing the free movement of services, including free flow of education, science and technology. And towards that end, they enacted a, um, the East African Community Common Market Protocol in 2009. Um, Kenya is a signatory. Um, in it, the, state, the, the member states agreed to eliminate tariffs, non-tariffs and technical barriers to trade by implementing a common trade policy for the community. My view, it's very aspirational because currently, um, obviously it's a signatory not ratified, Kenya has ratified it, and um, currently personal data of data subjects beyond that aspiration is still stored and siloed at a national level. I did, however, mention it because if there is further movement in this space and it is implemented, Kenya will then have to look at its current laws to align that with the intention of that common market protocol and that, and that specific framework. I'll also quickly mention the EAC legal framework for cyber laws. Again, aspirational, it's not a model law. Um, it's draft framework provides guidance and recommendations, doesn't specifically speak to data localization, which we are, we are focusing this discussion on here, but I thought I'd mention it also. Um, it does briefly mention um, data protection, but doesn't go beyond just giving broad concerns on the cost of regulation being a critical factor and the need to follow international best practice in this space. Um, I premise that I'll focus on the AFCFTA uh, agreement. It's quite a mouthful. I've been trying to get my head around it, and I always mix one or two of those um, um, words in that, in that acronym. Um, because of its impact, potential impact, uh, I, I would suggest. So I'll quickly run through that um, before going on to um, giving my recommendations and, um, and, and ending my discussion. Um, with respect to cross-border transfers, um, sorry, just jumped one there. The African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement is the AU's flagship project of the AU Agenda 2063. I thought I'd give some quick background in case any of the participants don't know what it's about. And that's Africa's blueprint for transforming Africa into a powerhouse for attaining inclusive and sustainable development in the continent. Effectively, it brings together all the 55 member states. Um, and we have a population of approximately 1.2 billion and a combined GDP of approximately 3.4 trillion. Um, currently, 38 countries have ratified the agreement and Kenya is, 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 is among them. Before I jump into specifically saying data localization and, and discussing the key provisions with respect to data localization, I thought I'd just give some quick background as to why I think it has a lot of potential impact. Obviously, we've said there are 55 member states, 1.2 billion. If implemented, um, as we'd all hope, um, it does effectively mean that we could be competitive with, for example, the Indian subcontinent or, for example, um, China. There are, however, many challenges. Um, for example, currently inter-African trade is about, and, and commerce is about 18%. Um, this agreement has ambitious goals to get it to be about 80% by 2035. And of course that remains to be seen. Um, there are many reasons as to why we, we have that low inter-African trade um, percentage. Um, one of those perhaps um, in my view is our reliance on I think continuing the, 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 the what I'd call the com colonial model of um, relying on primary commodities. And of course, we've seen when there are challenges such as global pandemics, that has a huge, um, a huge impact on, on us. Um, we are a very young continent. I think by reviewing something that said that by 2050, we'll probably have the, some of the largest, youngest population. So we need to think in that space. And digitization and digital trade um, as Fuller flagged in his comments, must be at the heart of any um, any agreement, any modern trade agreement anyway. Um, and from my review, um, this particular agreement is looking towards that space. They're developing a digital trade protocol. Um, I was also watching re um, the Secretary General recently um, discussing some of the um, more technical um, aspects that they're trying to to develop in that space, I, he and I think it was on CNBC when I was watching this. He had this, he discussed and mentioned that they're 
is a current um, pilot for a trade finance platform. Um, they're also developing a digital platform to facilitate customs. Um, so that's in the space of, for example, making it more efficient. So where, for example, a um, certificate of origin might currently take um, between trading partners 14 days to um, to be processed, that will be done inst instantaneously. They also, as I, they also, I think he had mentioned that there's also the development of, and they're doing this through um, the use of private bank, private banks, etc. The development of a Pan African payment um, and settlement system that they are trying to to develop. And part of the premise of that, of course, is to, um, you know, the, the, the impediments to trade when you're looking at currency conversions. All our African countries use different um, currencies when converting that. There are additional costs. And the reason why they're trying to pilot this program is to, of course, to deal with that currency conversion issues. So I thought I'd mention some 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 of those uh, specific issues. Um, there is a lot. I mean, we hope that that it will be implemented, um, and that that Africa will be enabled to harness that potential, um, because at the moment, I mean, if we look at our global trade and our global trade um, output, it's about three percent. Um, if we compare that with a singular country like Singapore, all our 55 states have a global output of five of 3%, while Singapore, just one country, has 6%. So there's a lot of room for growth. I thought I'd state that just because, I, as I said, I wanted to focus on this and the potential it has in, 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 in um, improving inter-African trade and also our global trade and commerce. Um, now back to, to the data privacy. Um, sorry, uh, the provisions with respect to data localization in it. So some of the key provisions include a commitment to liberalize, liberalize trade and services governed by principles on transparency and information disclosures. Um, it flags that whether any inconsistencies between the agreement and perhaps any other agreements, it will take precedence. Um, it also has a protocol on trade and services that defines trade and services to include the supply of a service from the territory of one state party into the territory of another. With respect to cross-border um, data transfers, it does not explicitly prohibit such transfers, but it provides that member states have a right to regulate matters enshrined in the agreement. Um, on payments and transfers, it provides that parties are prohibited from applying restrictions on international transfers and arguably international money transfers. Um, Every member state has general obligations under part four to trade fairly with other member states and remove any restrictions that would inhibit trade in services. So obviously the implication there being data localization, um, but article 15 does provide some general exceptions where restrictions may be allowed. Um, and in particular, I'll point out it, in respect to Kenya, it uses, it, it, it points out measures to protect public interest and morals. I had flagged earlier that Kenya's DPA may fall um, under these exceptions because of the localization requirements here are pegged on public interest. And that's where I was discussing um, public good as defined in our regulations. I'll quickly Hi, now- Malcolm. Yes? If you, you need to wrap up, please, if you could quickly okay. jump to recommendations. Thank you. All right, really quickly then, I'll, I'll jump to my, my um, recommendations. So, um, let's bear me with one moment. So these are my, my recommendations in, 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 in this space, and I'll quickly wrap up with these as Fola suggested. I apologize for running too long. Um, Kenya needs to develop a data, set, data center ICT infrastructure policy, um, which will set standards on data governance. Um, considering the impact of strict data localization measures on digital rights, um, uh, the legislative, uh, sorry, considering the impact of strict data localization me measures on digital rights as a legislative framework, that impinges on these may prove a deterrent for regional and international trade. So we need to think about that. We need to ratify the Malibu Convention. I flagged why, that I would flag that. Our, our regulations um, include the Malibu Convention as a um, adequacy requirement. And of course, that's a concern because we have not ratified it. So we, we, we mentioned them in the regulations, but we have not ratified it. So our policymakers need to think about that. Encouraging the use of bilateral data protection agreements. For example, Australia and Singapore have one. Kenya can look into that while it's um, looking at its broader international and regional treaty frameworks. Um, promoting cooperation and joint development of digital regulation frameworks. Um, 
I mentioned earlier agreeing to a non-exclusive data localization methods in the regulations rather than an exclusive one as is espoused now. Um, I've mentioned ratifying Malibu Convention and undertaking a holistic review of all those sector-specific laws I mentioned earlier um, to, to, to integrate them with our current data protection framework. The last recommendation I have is seeking out other forms of addressing key issues that have encouraged localization laws. And this is just giving an example of the US, considering how policy may help in addressing law enforcement and national security concerns prag pragmatically. So rather than looking at legislation, working with larger um, intermediary companies, we know that governments now do not have control of all the data. Companies like Google, Facebook, etc., cetera, um, have control of large, vast, amounts of our data. So working with these um, intermediaries such as search engines, social media and email platforms, building relationships with them and encouraging them to develop um, policies that will, will, will um, align with the government's self-interest rather than unilaterally developing data localization measures. Um, I will end it there. Uh, my apologies, as I said, for going too long. I hope that that, that will give you just a quick review of our data protection framework data localization issues um, as concerns regional frameworks. And as I said, I'll be happy to engage with um, participants beyond this, this forum. Thank you very much, Willem. Thank you so much, Malcolm. Thank you for the for the very engaging and in-depth uh, research you've done on this. Um, to our um, guests, if you do want to ask questions, um, please um, feel free to type them in the chat box uh, or reserve them to the end of the webinar. I will now move over to Nigeria, where we have uh, another paper that has been co-authored by um, doctors Abdurauf Lukman and doctors Oini Abe. Dr. Lukman holds a PhD from the University of South Africa with expertise in data privacy and is a senior lecturer at the University of Illinois. And his co-author, Dr. Abe, holds a PhD from the University of Pretoria with expertise in business and human rights. He's a senior research fellow at Ogis Institute at Afebola University, as well as at the Center for Comparative Law at the University of Cape Town. Thank you. Okay, do I have the floor? Okay. Yes, you do. Uh, uh, good afternoon from uh, Nigeria. Uh, Ni and I will uh, be looking at the economic impact of data localization uh, 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 from the Nigerian perspective. So we're going to divide this presentation in order not to take so long of a time. I'll start off by looking generally at data localization uh, in Nigeria, the basic policies and um, uh, doc, uh, Dr. Abe is going to look more, is going to be more focused on the impact from the trade uh, perspective. Uh, now, without waste of time, uh, I would like to start off by talking about or by emphasizing one fact of the increasing attitude of countries towards data localization. And this is particularly worrisome because it's an attitude that is being embraced by developing countries and not necessarily uh, developed countries. So basically, you now have countries trying to as much as possible localize data based on the whatsoever economic arguments they have in support of this. So the issue at hand is actually trying to, or trying to, uh, the issue at hand is actually trying to see how to balance the objectives of data localization, which are actually noteworthy, noteworthy, and the trade commitment of uh, different countries when it comes to uh, when it comes to the uh, uh, when it comes to the uh, international rules, when it comes to the regional rules, uh, particularly regional trade rules, and so so basically a discussion on data localization uh, and its economic impact will actually seek to focus more on trying to see how to balance that because we all know that data, data localization in a way has its own uh, policy objective or has its own justification but then we have to look onto a higher goal or we have to look onto uh, trying to bring forth a more benefits for uh, a particular country. I will not really focus so much on the meaning and trying to expound on the definition of data localization. Malcolm has done a very uh, great job in that regard. The only fact I need to point out is the definition or is the uh, perspective of data localization from the United Nations Conference on Trade uh, and Development, which talks about data localization as the economic control over data. 
And of course, that is actually relevant to this discussion because we found out well, in the course of this research, we've actually discovered that even though a lot of countries have a lot of node worthy or actually have laudable justification for data localization, it is somehow a back way or it is somehow a, a way to actually realize economic objective and that is why i am so much inclined to the economic definition or to the definition of data localization by the united nations conference on trade and development now as you see it is not really uh it is it i don't want to mention i don't want to talk about it as being a sad situation but when they are talking about countries with high data localization policies in the world nigeria is one of them you always when you see all works most of the big works on data localization, you find out that Nigeria is listed among the countries with high data localization policies. And unfortunately, it is increasingly and increasingly moving towards greater data localization. Now, from the nexus or trying to understand the nexus between data protection, data localization, and the Nigerian digital economy, we have seen that um, now uh, there is a there is a, there, there is a realization by countries of the world of what the digital economy can contribute to the GDP of countries. Unfortunately, rather, or unfortunately, developing countries are only coming to realize the immense significance or the, uh, the, the resources that is actually lying underneath a, a digital economy. On the Nigerian perspective, some effort has actually been made to develop the, uh, the digital economy because of probably a subtle realization of the benefit or an attempt to try to move away from the mono economy to a more diversified uh, economy. You can now see, or you can see one of the big initiatives towards a digital economy to be a renaming or trying to expand the scope of the Ministry of Information. It is now termed Ministry, it is now named Ministry of Information and Digital Economy. Not only that, the Ministry is also taking other initiatives to ensure a more robust digital, uh, or to ensure a more robust digital economy. One of the uh, initiatives is by bringing forth the Nigerian Economic, uh, Nigerian Economic Recovery Growth Plan of 2017 to 2020, which talks about trying to ensure we have a robust economy in Nigeria. There are also other initiatives like trying to expand on Nigeria's broadband penetration and some other, other, uh, some other initiatives, so to say, in, in that regard. Now, the issue or the next issue I'm, I would briefly consider is the issue of data localization and the Nigerian digital economy. What is the Nigerian digital, what is the Nigerian economy's attitude towards uh, data localization? Like you see, a very important, a very instrumental work on data localization written by, by, by Chandler, I think Chandler and Lee, have actually categorized uh, or have actually tried to classify various perspectives of data localization. So the fact that there are no explicit policies on data localization or explicit laws, so to say, I'm sorry, explicit laws on data localization does not mean that a country has not or is not in a way moving towards data localization. That is the case with Nigeria. You cannot find any specific law that localizes data or that gives explicit recognition or explicit provision on data localization, even though you find traces of it in the Nigerian Data Protection uh, Bill. But you can find a lot of policies on data localization, a lot of policies, a lot of guidelines, a lot of regulations on data localization. In our work, Ni and I actually looked at the key policies, looking at it from the perspective of uh, particular agencies which are responsible, which are actually instrumental in trying to develop the digital economy. I must say that in trying to develop the digital economy, one of the fundamental principles is to ensure the free movement of, uh, of information, both personal and non-personal information, the free movement of data. And in our argument, in our paper, we said or we, uh, we argued that data localization is actually one of the impediments. So why Nigeria is in a way trying to develop the digital economy, it is also going in another way to try to, so to say, restrict or try to bring about hindrances to the apps or to the effective development of the digital economy. So now what are these policies? What are some of these initiatives that actually points to the fact that Nigeria is moving, increasingly moving towards data localization? We have the NITDA regulation, NITDA initiative. NITDA is actually supposed to be the federal government agency responsible for information technology 
technology development. And it is also one of the key parastatals of the Ministry of Information and Digital, uh, uh, and Digital Economy. And that particular agency is responsible, is also supposed to see to achievement of a robust digital economy. But unfortunately, that agency has a lot of guidelines or has a lot of instruments, policy instruments, which actually points to data localization. One of the instruments is the guidelines for Nigerian content development in ICT 2013, which provides that all indigenous original equipment manufacturers must assemble all hardware in Nigeria. Of course, not only assembling all hardware uh, with regards to ICT in Nigeria, but ensure that the data that is actually associated with this hardware do not actually or do not leave the shores uh, of the country. There are also other initiatives uh, in this regard. There is another initiative of, of NITSDA, that's the Nigerian Information Technology Development Agency, and that is the Nigerian Cloud Computing Policy of 2019. Of course, that policy aims to bring about an effective use, or effective adoption of cloud computing uh, in Nigeria, but then it's categorized certain category of data as government data, and that means if a data is classified or if it's categorized as government data, there is a restriction to the extent to which it can move. That's that for NITSDA. There are also a couple of other secondary policies which actually looks onto data localization. Then another important agency is the Nigerian Communication Commission. Of course, that's the regulatory agency in terms of telcos, telecoms in Nigeria or telecommunication infrastructure in Nigeria. It has a key principle or it has a key, so to say, regulation. The Nigerian Communication uh, Commission's Registration of Tele uh, Telephone Subscribers Regulation 2011. And that regulation is very explicit with regards to talking about the non-transferability the, the non -transferability of certain kind of communication data outside Nigeria. All information which is stored in a central database are regarded as a property of the federal government of Nigeria and should not be, trans and should not be transmitted outside Nigeria except under other OS, except under certain clearly defined circumstances. That's another policy by a key agency that is also instrumental in development of a digital economy that brings about data localization. Uh, finally, uh, the Central Bank of Nigeria also has measures that aims at or that seeks to achieve data localization. There is a guidelines on the point of sale or uh, guideline on the point of sale card acceptance service uh, of the Central Bank of Nigeria, which regulates domestic transaction performed with the proper uh, for the uh, with card or uh, with uh, 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 various card financial card services. One of the key principles or one key provision of that particular uh, guideline is that all domestic transactions must be switched using services of a local switch and shall not under any circumstance be routed outside Nigeria. There are other measures. These are the key or oh, these are the most significant measures that seek to achieve data localization. But there are also other measures, particularly or the most noteworthy among them is the content or is the effect of the Nigerian Data Protection or Nigerian Data, uh, Nigerian Data Protection Bill, which is a bill that is actually before the legislative house. Even though there are arguments, you see some, uh, some movement or you see some intentment by that particular law to seek or to bring about a more direct, a more forceful data localization uh, policy, or a more forceful data localization uh, initiative, which as uh, uh, Ni is going to speak to shortly, has its impact on Nigeria's regional commitment uh, or Nigeria's regional uh, trade commitment towards trade liberal and liberalization and towards bringing about free trade on the uh, African continent. So I'm going to stop here and I'll leave uh, Ni to continue or Ni to speak to the impact of uh, data localization on Nigeria's regional commitment. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Over to you. Over to you, Dr. Abe. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Fola, and thank you very much. Look, my first of all, uh, thanks to the Mandela Institute for um, giving us this platform to share um, our research. So, um, like my colleague said, I'm just going to jump uh, straight into um, trade obligations, Nigeria's trade obligations vis a vis. Um, the data localization policies. So from Nigeria's perspective, data protectionism is a call on 
local content requirements. That's just the punchline. Um, and it has very strong rules and regulations regarding local content requirements. Um, so while it is not possible at the moment to set international uh, rules on data protectionism, um, the, the setting of trade barriers, which is Nigeria's data localization policies, um, at the moment um, is high enough to discourage imports or to raise prices sufficiently, which will enable um, inefficient domestic producers uh, to compete successfully with foreigners. That inefficient domestic production flies in the face of regional trade agreements, which Nigeria um, has entered into. Um, and the problem remains uh, in terms of ob Nigeria's obligations. Recently, especially at the height of the pandemic, we saw uh, Nigeria close its borders uh, within ECOWAS. And I just learned recently as well, some ECOWAS countries have also uh, retaliated by uh, not allowing some goods and services uh, to enter into, into Nigeria. This, this happened at the same time Nigeria signed uh, ratified the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement. Uh, so the question becomes the issue of political will and the necessity of actually ratifying some of these bilateral trade agreements considering uh, the digital localization policies which it has. So um, I'm going to speak precisely on the African Continental uh, Free Trade Agreement for a number of reasons. One, it's very new uh, in Africa and it's also very ambitious in terms of liberalizing trade across the continent and also it has not really been tested so far compared to uh, most ECOWAS protocols, free movement of uh, goods, persons, and services. Um, the, the, the Africa Continental Free Trade Area Agreement, which I'm just going to uh, um, refer to as CAFTA, uh, f f does not regulate data localization procedures per se, uh, but it provides some uh, model of protection alongside actions uh, which constrain the cross-border transfer and storage of data, uh, particularly where uh, such restrictions are aimed at international investors. Um, the requirement for data localization, as Lukman has said, is not that one of the most aggressive non-tariff barrier uh, to trade in both goods and services. Another point is that Nigeria is not, has not yet made a full on, uh, commitment on the CAFTA. So it is very much uh, very difficult to conclude whether it can impose market access barriers, even despite its data localization laws, uh, preventing foreign investors from operating in the domestic market. Um, if Nigeria had made some full commitments in, in, in AFTA, it certainly cannot claim or require foreign investors to be domesticated before they can operate locally or, or restrict cross-border data transfers, especially through um, electronic means, as that would be completely against uh, the intent and workings of uh, the trade agreements. Besides, the, uh, uh, another difficulty in actually um, blending data localization with trade obligations is the fact that uh, the multilateral trading system under the WTO has not actually created a clear rule. Uh, nobody has acted under the disposition body, nobody has challenged the data localization laws as a form of impediment to um, uh, the, the idea of trade liberalization. Um, if you look at Article 18 of GATS, uh, prohibits any form of discrimination against foreign suppliers in sectors where member states have committed to, uh, in Nigeria, especially when you look at telecommunications and the financial services sectors, which is kind of an alternative to the oil economy, um, you discover that the data localization policies cannot even work as it will create a serious economic embargo on Nigeria itself. So um, again, uh, domestication of servers in Nigeria, for example, could result in high cost, uh, ele electricity, security challenges, and and some other things which, which could frustrate the operation of those domestication of hardware software in Nigeria. Now, if um, Article 16, so in terms of CAFTA, um, we looked at Article 6 and 15, a uh, sub C paragraph 2 of the AFTA's, um, CAFTA's Protocol on Trade and Services, uh, which regulates the ability of uh, member states to transfer and store data across national border. While Article 6 prevents member state, Nigeria, for example, from disclosing confidential information and data where such disclosure will impede law enforcement or be contrary to the public interest um, or prejudice legitimate commercial interest of businesses. Um, that uh, prejudice legitimate commercial interests, quote unquote, is something which Nigeria could lay uh, anchor on in providing data localization policies. So the general exception, it appears that the general exception clauses or articles from uh, CAFTA data provisions under Article 15 especially allows Nigeria to adopt protectionist measures uh, such as data localization, 
where such measures guarantee the protection of the privacy of individuals um, in relation to the processing and dissemination of personal data and protecting confidentiality of, of individual records and accounts. Um, so to an extent, we can say CAFTA allows the um, data localization and at the same time facilitates free trade for obvious reasons. So in effect, Article 6 um, facilitates cross-border data flows by permitting businesses to transfer data amongst member states. However, where the transfer of data concerns any of the identified sectors, such sectors will be provided. All right. So um, again, data localization, which is guaranteed under Article 15 of the protocol, will only be justified where the reasons of such restrictions are not enforced in a way that would constitute arbitrary and unjustified discrimination between member states. So a combined effect of these articles uh, does not prevent Nigeria from adopting trade restrictions in pursuit of legitimate commercial interest, provided such interests are not arbitrary and unjustifiable. Whether the reasons Nigeria will give for justifiably um, ensuring data localization is something that is open to debate and, and research by scholars. But what we do know is that the impact of these provisions will enable state parties to craft a broad scope of policy objectives to protect the citizens. So the question uh, we contended with was how legitimate data localization measures are in Nigeria to warrant um, a consideration of policy objectives determination. Unfortunately, CAFTA provides no guidance. Uh, and it is expected that any reason whatsoever or any policy goals, security, health, education, an attempt to destabilize Nigeria, like the Twitter uh, case recently, would suffice. Again, um, Article 15 of that same CAFTA protocol is more or less a reproduction of the requirements under Article 14, uh, sub, uh, sub C, paragraph 2 of GATS, which provides that measures should not be applied arbitrarily. Um, so it, we, we, we discover that it appears uh, that CAFTA's data rules appear to be more expensive than even GATS approach, um, as it includes data localization measures that do not constitute breach of national treatment or market access obligations of WTO. So under CAFTA rules, Nigeria could require, um, Nigeria could require local and international investors to store data on servers, servers within their Nigeria or state parties jurisdiction before commencing businesses. So as a result of that, such an action will not actually violate national treatment or market access as those acts are non-discriminatory. However, there is some hope uh, with regards to CAFTA. Um, the negotiations of phase two is ongoing, and one of the topics under the, the negotiations will be digital trade. And it is expected that stakeholder con uh, consultations, which are going to brainstorm and um, discussions on the content for the plant protocol and digital trade, we consider some of these challenges on how data localization restricts um, trade on one hand, and it also protects domestic investors and how countries can actually uh, fulfill their obligations under the, the uh, regional trade agreements. Because when states restrict the free flow of data, they reduce access to information. And access to information can in turn diminish economic growth productivity and innovation domestically and global, globally. Um, Nigeria claims that its data localization measures is, for example, to protect domestic entrepreneurs. But you discover that domestic entrepreneurs actually look forward to employing expatriates and looking for information or access to, to data or servers in other countries apart from Nigeria. Um, data localization affects the functioning of the internet, for example. So if officials restrict cross-border data flows, they may create many unintended consequences. Even though this doesn't happen uh, in Nigeria, in Cuba, we saw where the internet was shut off and uh, uh, to, to, to curtail um, uh, restiveness. Even in Nigeria, uh, let's, for a split second, let's just consider that Twitter were a Nigerian company, all right, with a wide African outreach and the server, the tools, the hardware and software domesticated in Nigeria. Um, and, and Nigeria comes up with its policy and says, okay, Twitter has been used actually to destabilize Nigeria and therefore shuts down Twitter. So what's going to happen to South African, for example, has invested heavily, who has Twitter account, who has all the information uh, in Twitter, which is domesticated in Nigeria. So such policy objectives is some of the challenges we have um, and, and political decisions can rumble continental markets um, despite the trade liberalization. And the subsequent governments as well May, may face the pressure to localize some categories of data, uh, to address public policy concerns, for example, to provide to protect citizens' health records. 
So if a bilateral trade agreement, which Nigeria has ratified, um, a significant good number of them, uh, was seen to prevent states' uh, capacity to police in some critical areas, so, so, such as infrastructure, it would face a strong backlash from community st stakeholders. Uh, and, and we think that was what the Nigerian government sought to do pre-ratification of CAFTA. Uh, it delayed in ratifying CAFTA, and one of the reasons it sought was that it was consulting with stakeholders, Nigerian businesses, whether CAFTA would actually impede or prevent uh, domestic entrepreneurs or domestic investors, or there would be um, a kind of conflict between domestic investors and foreign investors, and foreign investors would dominate Nigerian businesses or impact Nigerian businesses negatively. And that was what the Nigerian government claimed then, that it was doing in delaying to ratify CAFTA. So while there appears to be some ambiguity about what may constitute a legitimate policy objective for data localization in Nigeria, um, especially considering a country that is prone to dictatorial regulations, uh, the inclusion of a broad public policy exception is fundamental, uh, given, and this is very important, given the continuing swift development of te digital technologies and the related ambiguity surrounding the impending connections of trade liberalization and societal interest in this area. So as we continue to move towards digital trade, it is expected uh, that Nigeria in particular will consider its data localization measures, which appears to be a very an expansive measure uh, in terms of broad policy um, uh, goals, and consider that with the determination uh, with its commitment under um, its regional trade agreements and the idea of the multilateral trading system of uh, WTO, which um, uh, prohibits uh, closed borders um, and allows access to free flow of data information goods and services. And one of our recommendations or one of our conclusions was that well, Nigeria could have some legitimate reasons to limit cross-border data flow. Um, like I said, to um, develop its domestic tech sector, uh, competition, uh, digital literacy, um, infrastructure development, although that is yet to be seen in terms of real sea uh, air infrastructure development in Nigeria. However, uh, we consider the fact that data localization measures end up discriminating against foreign market actors and distort trades. Uh, one of the fastest moving, uh, not only in Nigeria, one of the fastest means of um, uh, trade in, uh, in, in Nigeria and uh, across Africa is the informal cross-border trade. Um, if, if, if data, if laws are too punitive, too restrictive, um, domestic entrepreneurs will look for another way to ease the free flow of data. And that might be a serious challenge for a country like Nigeria uh, that sometimes could have weak enforcement of its laws um, uh, in some of these aspects. So it is important that Nigeria examines whether it's domestic policies uh, that restrict data, um, short of exceptions in terms of national security, privacy, or public moral uh, exceptions, constitute barriers to cross-border data flows that could be challenged in trade disputes. Um, but a kind of optimism that this could actually be, um, this, this too can work hand in hand, um, is, is a reference to the Financial Times report in 2018 that what may appear protectionist to one country could be seen as legitimate and necessary regulation in another country. But so far, um, we've not seen that. In uh, the policy objectives which Nigeria has, uh, has crafted to create data localization measures doesn't seem to be in sync with even its own domestic policy objectives of allowing free access to trade uh, in terms of opening its market to foreign investors and again, um, following its uh, commitment under uh, regional trade uh, agreements. Uh, thank you very much for um, this opportunity. Th th thank you so much, um, Niyiri. Th that was a very, very fascinating um, analysis of the development in Nigeria. I recognize the fact that we are at the um, end of our hour, but I would still like to give participants who are eager to stay on the opportunity to ask questions. We already have a question from Amrit, which I believe that would be most appropriate for um, both Niyi and um, Malcolm to answer relating to um, elaborating on the economic protection protectionism critique of exclusive data localization laws um, and whether data localization requirements could potentially inadvertently increase infrastructure costs 
which are subsequently passed on to consumers. I think that was more or less how you were ending your 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 argument, Niyi. So if you could speak about this further, and then Malcolm could also speak about that from a Kenyan perspective. I do have a question for for um, um, Dr. Lukman as well, when you spoke about the Nigerian Information Technology Development Agency, NISTA, um, having this big um mandates and uh, effectively regulating data localization through a policy and there have been arguments in some quarters that yeah. this appears to be institutional overreach and that this agency actually does not have that big of a mandate to be um enacting or implementing a data localization policy um so over to you um, i guess um Nii, since you are the last speaker you might as well immediately tackle the question from amrit Oh, thank you very much, Fulan. Thanks, for Amrit. Uh, well, that's a very legitimate question and very important. Like I said while I was rounding up, um, data localization measures, I mean, it's either way you look at it, it ends up discriminating against foreign market investors and distort uh, trade uh, uh, with regards to informal cross border challenges. And one thing that is actually striking is that when you look at countries around the world that actually have these data localization measures, they're mostly developing economies. and. One of the questions that you, you, you think is, these are countries that actually should um, open up their markets to, um, uh, to liberalization. But then you have this idea of economic protectionism um, or data protectionism or data sovereignty, as some people uh, will refer to it, uh, data localization requirements indeed increases infrastructure costs. Let's take, for example, Nigeria, for example. And I'm not really being pessimistic here. I'm just, I'm just being real. Um, uh, electricity is a non-existent factor uh, in Nigeria uh, and a good number of uh, other issues uh, uh, as regards to that. So how will manufacturers, I mean, Nigeria came up with the idea that it, it did not ratify the um, or sign into the Akafta on time because it wanted to um, discuss with lo local businesses or Nigerian investors whether uh, the provisions of Akafta will be uh, punitive or discriminatory towards them. But again, you you think about Nigerian businesses or foreign investors that will have to think twice before investing even in Nigeria, uh, where they will have to provide an alternative means of electricity to it for them to be able to power their um, uh, uh, whatever industry they are in. And this has implications. Uh, when MTN came to Nigeria too many years ago, it was uh, MTN is a Nigerian telecommunication. Uh, uh, domesticated and agile telecommunications company, there were a significant number of reasons that it was expensive. And MTN said, well, if we have to store our data, our booster, uh, uh, all our servers in Nigeria, we have to power it 24 7. And there's no electricity, so we have to create another means of, uh, uh, means of, uh, uh, of, of power. And what is the implication of that? Like you indicated, the costs are transferred as well to um, uh, consumers. So that is why we felt that. The policy objectives with Nigeria itself as given for data localization does not really to an extent make sense because it hasn't really done much in terms of encouraging domestic investors. It hasn't really done much in terms of creating that avenue for innovation, uh, for domestic technology, uh, for competition within uh, in Nigeria. So why would even the issue of data localization even uh, be coming? Now, we believe that um, li trade liberalization is the key to actually help or assist uh, domestic entrepreneurs. Um, yeah, so I don't know if I've answered the question. Yeah, but yeah that, that's just what I think it's an important question and something that we, we believe Nigeria should look into in blending its data localization commitment with its trade obligations. Thank you. Thank you. Any thoughts, Malcolm? Yeah, I'll, I'll quickly jump in. I'm, I'm, I'm in agreement that um, um, it does discriminate against um, free market investors. Um, in Kenya, there's, a, there's an argument in, in, in many policy, by many policy makers that um, um, these data localization restrictions may boost economic activities within the country and as a result promote economic growth and output. And the reason they are saying that is that primarily um, it will create demand for uh, market demand for regional and local data centers and for software and hardware that would facilitate geographical um, localization. But and I think that that is really just a short term thinking in the interim, the laws may create jobs and attract like foreign direct investment on ICT. And that's just with respect to the infrastructure and resources required. However, in the long term, they will raise the cost of conducting business because 
these organizations will only be limited to the resources within the country. And strict implementation of these restrictions will mean that the supply and demand ratio will increase and cost organizations a lot more money to ensure compliance. I mean, Amrit would be um, familiar with perhaps um, in, his in, in his work that Kenya, if you look at data centers, for example, in Kenya, there are only about 10, I think, um, uh, serving a population of about 50 million. So if we have data localization requirements, more data centers will have to be created. That means what? Increased, um, increased costs. I, um, beyond that, electricity is an issue here. Their lack of resources, adequate skills to maintain these data centers. Um, the cost of maintaining them is ex exacerbated by electricity requirements, reliance on skilled labor. To date, I don't think in Kenya there is that skilled labor to actually maintain these data centers. So data centers which are highly automated will also be. Um, so also on another, I, th I think another way of thinking about this is whilst the policy makers might argue that, well, we're going to get more data centers, we'll get more job offerings at inception, but these things are highly automated. So another issue is that once um, the data center is built and complete, these, those who are employed will be made redundant. Um, and so in my view, it won't basically affect a rise in, in, in employment um, and the creation of more data centers will not automatically translate into creation of jobs in the long term. So um, that's my view in, in, in terms of this space. I don't know if you have any other questions. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Thank you, Malcolm. And um, Dr. Lukman, um, the question on institutional overreach. Uh, you asked the question, but you are breaking slightly, so I didn't really get the question. I think you asked oh, the sorry. question. Oh, sorry. Yes, I did. I was asking about whether you thought that the needs that the Nigeria Information Technology Development Agency um, is engaging in institutional overreach by enacting a sweeping data localization policy when its enabling le legislation actually does not give it that kind of mandate to to be implementing that kind of um, sweeping policy. Obviously, I think that's just uh, that's just it. You have just uh, said it uh, very clearly. Uh, the Nigerian Information Technology Development Agency is supposed to be an agency of the Ministry of Information. Uh, it's not supposed to, as some of us will argue, that even the Nigeria, Nigerian Data Protection Regulation is supposed to, is actually beyond the mandate of uh, ANISTA. It's actually carrying out uh, 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 a function beyond its uh, actual power. But since in the absence of any particular institution, in the absence of any particular, say, data protection institution, the absence of a data protection law, I think everybody just uh, tries to be comfortable with that idea without understanding uh, some of the implications. Because I believe that some of the policies that are being carried out, some of the policies that are implemented or that are pushed out by NITS that are actually policies that do not really take into cognizance the larger effect on be it the economy or on the nation itself. So I agree. I think I actually agree that NITS is actually going beyond its mandate by bringing in sweeping data, uh, data localization uh, policies. Thank you very much. Thank you. Th and thank you to our participants participants for this very engaging and fascinating conversation. Um, to everyone who's attended, um, we will share the um, final papers that have been presented today with you via email. Sorry that um, I couldn't upload it via chat. Um, for those of you who are only attending this webinar series for the first time. This is part of a series of webinars that we've been hosting at the Mandela Institute since the beginning of the year. The last one we hosted was looking at this same topic, data localization, but specifically um, in relation to South Africa. So the, the paper that was also presented from the last webinar um, looking at South Africa will also be shared with you. Our next webinar, which will be happening hopefully um, next month, um, we'll be looking at competition policy and, and data localization. Um, we are truly um, grateful for engaging with us today and thank you again to our guests for this excellent work. Thank you very much, everyone. And thank you very much. Thank you very Cheers. much, Fola. Bye, Bye, everyone.